welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, one of the many reasons I record this show every day is having the ability to talk to people from all over the world who share their unique insights and perspectives. And people often say to me, Neil, how do you find the time to do a daily podcast? And let's be honest here, if I can't spend 30 minutes out of my 16 hours a day just having a relaxed chat with someone outside of my circle, then I'd be doing something wrong because I think the benefits of busting out of your echo chamber and talking to different people, that's where the magic happens. And a podcast, people overcomplicate it, but really it can be as simple as hopping on a Zoom call and having a conversation. And if anyone's interested in launching their own podcast and working with me, I'll do all the heavy lifting. If you want to find out more about how you can do that, send me a quick email, techblogwriteroutlook.com, because outside of this, I do also manage about 15 other podcasts for businesses, etc. So you can pop by my website for that too, techblogwriter.co.uk. But our guest today is Dan Sommer. And the company is called Click. Now, their Twitter says Click is committed to changing the world by making it easier for people to make more insightful, data-driven decisions and act on them. But for me, Dan's definition of the company as a US company with a Swedish soul, I find that a little more beautiful. But that's just me, my aging hippie ways. Now, Dan is also a former Gartner analyst, as well as Click's global market intelligence lead. And he first appeared on my radar when I saw that he said that that 2023 is all about being ready for crisis and how businesses must hone the accuracy of their decision making if they want to anticipate unexpected events and achieve connected governance in a world of disparate and siloed data sets. Certainly has a way with words, does Dan. So I'm quite excited to get him on the podcast today. So buckle up and hold on tight, because no matter where you're listening in the world, I'm going to be beaming your ears all the way to Stockholm, Sweden, where Dan is waiting to share his story. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure, Neil. And thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm very uh, interested and excited to, to be on this uh, very astute podcast. Uh, my name is Dan Sommer, and I run the market intelligence team at Click. Uh, I've been doing that for seven, I think it's almost eight years now. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was a Gartner uh, research director. So I very much come from the world of research uh, and kind of taking the outside in perspective of uh, what's going on in the world. And in Click, I'm responsible for kind of what the forest looks like, not just the trees. So kind of the market overview, but also, uh, you know, in my team, we have competitive intelligence. We have, you know, uh, aspects of customer intelligence as well, uh, what our customers prefer um so that's in in broad brush strokes kind of my my profile fantastic and i did speak with um adam mayer last year but for anyone listening who missed that particular conversation and hearing about click for the first time can you tell me a little bit more about the company and the kind of problems that you're solving with technology yeah sure Click is uh, what some people refer to as uh, an american company with a swedish soul uh it's originated in sweden uh, from the area of analytics. Uh, it's kind of the original gangster for democratizing uh, analytics and, and BI so that it becomes more self-service and more business-oriented and uh, has been a hugely successful company, now has close to 40,000 active customers in over 100 countries. So we're truly multinational. And as a private company now, we've also expanded beyond the world of analytics uh, to things like data integration, uh, data management, uh, in order to really like own the end-to-end chain of, of closing the loop between data, uh, insights, and action. Uh, we think if, if like many people can do that in organizations, it's, it's truly transformational. And the, the reason we wake up every morning is we want to create a more data literate world, which we think is is very, very important uh, and, and uh, yeah, exciting. 
Fantastic. And there's so much I'm looking forward to talking with you about today, because just when we thought the term unprecedented might have been put to bed, we find ourselves stuck in almost a perfect storm because an economic recession and organisations all over the world are all looking at the, the bottom lines right now and trying to figure out why they need to invest or what they need to invest in to future proof their businesses and what is essentially just a nice to have. So I'm curious, what trends are you seeing from the conversations that you're having with your customers around the world? Yeah, it's um, I completely concur with you. It's you know we're we're turning on the news and the same news reels are appearing and it's it's extremely. Yeah. Uh, we thought we were past unprecedented, but there's a perfect storm that we're finding ourselves in. And uh, uh, when it comes to tech investments, we've certainly seen a lot of investments and modernizations even before uh, this happened during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, crisis. Uh, And as a result of that, uh, there's a couple of aspects that organizations are now focusing on. Uh, One is all of those investments that were made during uh, the pandemic, we're trying to kind of um, connect the dots between them. Uh, Many organizations' architectures can look a little bit like a Jackson Pollock painting very dispersed, very distributed, and we need to kind of connect the dots between those. So that's what I call calibrating the integration. But we also see, especially with everything that's going on in the world, and you mentioned bottom lines there, Neil, uh, we certainly see uh, organizations needing to do things smarter, that we we can't have any fat in the system anymore, uh, and we need more informed decision-making and action. Uh, So that's what I call calibrating the decision. Uh, Those are the two kind of macro areas I see. But budget-wise, it's kind of going all over the place. We're seeing some organizations investing themselves out of this crisis. Uh, uh, But certainly, you know, sales cycles are elongating. Uh, We see more C-level involvement uh, when it comes to investments. Uh, And some are counter-cyclical, for example, in the public sector. Uh, that are also investing, uh, while other organizations are declining their their kind of transformation and innovation budget. So uh, it's a little bit all over the shop, but the areas that organizations are particularly focused in are things like how to improve decisions, uh, decision velocity, but also data stories, how to really tell stories with data. Uh, and finally, there's a lot of talk about supply chains. You know, initially, as you mentioned in the in the pandemic, we had massive shortages, and now we're kind of having an oversupply as we're hitting we're hit with a kind of economic crisis. So calibrating that is very important, and analytics will certainly help here. And then finally, I'll just mention everything around AI. As you know, there's a lot of buzz around generative AI models right now. So that that's kind of the topics that I tend to see when I'm speaking to to my clients and and executives and such. And on top of that, we're also seeing huge shifts in the tech landscape too, with VC funding declining, conflicting regulations coming into place all around the world, and also a lack of access to much-needed tech and data skills continues to almost tie organizations in knots. So how are you seeing businesses adapt to these changes and challenges that right across the landscape in multiple industries? Indeed, Neil. And it's interesting that the skills shortages um, that you mentioned, I mean, I, I, I've been having some recent discussions where I've been kind of gauging the temperature, whether that has changed anything, uh, given, you know, there has been some highly publicized layoffs in sort of large companies in the tech sector recently. But my understanding is skills shortages are still rampant, uh, to your point. And uh, I'm seeing a little bit of a shift from the tech sector and all of those skills coming into the end user sector. And that tends to be a pendulum that shifts, right? That when, when times are good, people leave the end user sector and they, they start a bunch of, they form a bunch of startups. Uh, and when times are like this, they tend to go back into the end user sector perhaps. So that's a dynamic I'm seeing from skills shortages perspective. Some organizations, especially in, in manufacturing and such are insourcing to improve their supply chains, uh, while others who need access to very hard to come by skills, because that still is the case, uh, for example, for data engineers, we see uh, a lot of remote hiring. Uh, It's kind of become the new normal. So you can hire in other countries uh, to get those skills. However, of course, the thing in Ukraine and and 
uh, has disrupted that somewhat because we lost a lot of skills that we could have previously been able to get. You also mentioned VCs there. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're seeing 50, 60 percent declines, according to some companies. Uh, I think Crunchbase had some numbers on that uh, year on year in decline in VC uh, investments. So uh, I think organizations that buy technology are shifting uh, a lot from kind of VC funded startups increasingly to kind of value and profitable companies that can prove value over time and become sustainable. So that's, I think, a dynamic that we're seeing as well. And then finally, you mentioned conflicting regulations. Absolutely. You know, we're seeing uh, kind of uh, data stacks forming in China, data stacks forming in, in the US. We have all kinds of regulations. And uh, what we see there is that things like hybrid cloud and multi-cloud, where you have your data in different places, is moving from a nice to have to a must because you need that to comply to regulations. Uh, so that's definitely a dynamic we're seeing there, um, the move to multi and hybrid cloud. And of course, every business leader now needs to make smarter data-formed decisions to navigate around economic uncertainty. And as a result, businesses must hone the accuracy of their decision-making. They want to anticipate unexpected events, navigate around them, and achieve connected governance. But in a world of disparate and siloed data sets, it it seems like the ultimate conundrum. But can you share any insights around that too and, and how to get around this? Yeah, sure. Uh, as as you paint the picture, it is a fragmented uh, landscape right yeah. now, and the organizations are trying to achieve those two things, connected governance, uh, where their data is, sometimes not by choice, but by default, sitting in different places. In fact, Gartner has a prediction around that, that more than half of your enterprise data will be uh, outside of your data center. So that needs to be addressed. Uh, and we're seeing uh, organizations leverage a lot of kind of methodologies uh, w- like data fabric and data mesh to have some sort of a central uh, and governed approach to distributed data set. Uh, I think we can take it one step further, this notion of a data fabric, which essentially is like a, a different approaches of having some sort of a, a central uh, management and governance layer of distributed data sets Uh, through different sort of semantic technologies. Uh, And as such, organizations are using, for example, uh, catalogs to be able to have one place to see that distributed data state uh, and using methodologies like data fabric. When it comes to the accuracy of decision-making, like you mentioned, I think, especially with everything that happened in the pandemic and afterwards with disrupted supply chains in Ukraine, in China, uh, as I said, nearshoring is one thing that we're seeing and a big demand for real-time or near real-time data. So I think a lot of organizations previously were wondering like, well, do we really need real-time data? I think that discussion has kind of moved on to what what of our data sets do we need to have real-time? Uh, and once you have those, uh, then you need uh, not just the data velocity, which you get with real time, but increasingly like decision velocity, as I call it. Um, so uh, how can you optimize the decisions in your organization? If you're a retailer, for example, uh, you could just pass on the costs uh, to uh, your customers or you could be smarter and have more decision velocity, more optimized decisions and as such, uh, win a lot of market shares. So we're seeing that uh, a lot of hype around things like automation, RPA, app automation, and other technologies like that for the very repeatable and high volume decisions in organizations. So that's kind of the automation aspect of it. Uh, Then there's a human aspect of it as well. As I mentioned, uh, a lot of people are still struggling with kind of, we have all of this information, how do we shorten the time from information to insights to actual action? If you can shorten that for for thousands of people in your organization, it's gonna have a huge effect. And that's where this whole notion of data literacy comes in as well. Uh, So there's both a human component of improving decisions and an automation component that I see. 
And I'm curious, if we were to zoom out for a moment, do you think we're going to see much more market consolidation? And if we do, what kind of impact do you expect this to have? I do think that we will see a lot more market consolidation. As I mentioned, on the supply side, there's a VC crunch going on. Uh, And on the demand side, I think I mentioned as well that we see uh, elongated sales cycles, more C-level involvement. And C-levels, they don't want to talk to 10 different companies. They want to talk to three different companies. And as such, I do think that uh, when times are like this, we'll see more market consolidation. And especially as we're now moving from like an on-premise world, uh, we're moving all of that data. It's the times of great migration of data from on-premise increasingly to the cloud. And when that is happening, when you're moving all your data to the cloud uh, and to the cloud-based data warehouses and cloud-based analytics, there's a number of adjacent markets that are forming uh, like data quality, data governance, data observability, Etc. And just like in the on-premise world, that used to be very kind of uh, fragmented, distributed markets with lots of uh, providers, but increasingly that consolidated over time. And I think we'll see something similar in the cloud as well, where currently it's a little bit of a wild west with a bunch of startups doing uh, this very exciting world of data and analytics in the cloud. So I think we'll see consolidation as well. And final point on the consolidation piece, this should be good for customers uh, because there's a bunch of leakage in these data pipelines between like all of those aspects that I mentioned, like information, uh, insights, and action. If you buy all of those technologies from different vendors, different standards, different technologies, there's going to be leakage. But if you're buying that from one vendor, uh, there's a bunch of optimizations that can be done, which will then drive more value for customers that can basically... Uh, like be more value oriented with what they want to achieve with analytics. And it was just a few months ago that analysts and futurists were making predictions for the trends that will dominate this year. A lot didn't see chat G, G, uh, GPT coming, but another trend that we're seeing right now as we get towards the end of Q1 of 2023 is the rise of synthetic data. So can you tell me a little bit more about that and what you think that means for businesses too? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think with all of these kind of foundational models and uh, generative adversarial networks and and neural nets and all of these kind of AI technologies that are coming, uh, there is uh, a lot of opportunity to basically create data sets that have similar artifacts and similar attributes to uh, quote unquote real data. Uh, And as such, uh, it can solve a lot of uh, issues, uh, for example, for smaller organizations that don't have a lot of data, frankly, to train their AI on, uh, or uh, for privacy reasons, you want to obfuscate data um, so that people don't know who you are uh, for either regulatory purposes or other purposes. Or when you are, for example, a large, huge bank uh, and other organizations, and you want to do scenario modeling, um then you know which i think is increasingly important right now because we've spoken about real time data that's the ability to react but increasingly you want to what i call preact as well uh to different contingencies and different scenarios that might potentially happen in the future so for all of these purposes you can use uh, synthetic data uh to model that out and as such uh, we see very, very big increases in organizations using uh, synthetic data. In some cases, it has even better effects than the real data. So it's a very exciting evolution. And uh, I'm quoting Gartner again, they think that uh, synthetic data will completely overshadow real data when it comes to like model building and and, uh, data science and such. And before you came on the podcast, I was doing a bit of research on you, and I quickly learned about your passion, about the the need for AI to to move deeper into the pipeline in order to consolidate and strengthen an organization's data processing. Is that something you can expand on too for everyone listening? In At least in the world of data and analytics, we've seen a lot of uh, focus on data at the end of the chain, when we're actually having a dashboard or when we're analyzing the results 
Uh, it could be suggestions for you or that you can interact through a natural language interface. But increasingly, I think uh, there's cross-pollination happening. And partly because of that consolidation that I spoke about earlier, you can take a lot of those smarts and you can put it earlier uh, when you're actually uh, prepping the data. And I think that has a lot of benefits, uh, again, uh, for personally identifiable information or about triggering uh, uh, causing triggers that can uh, bring you the right data at the right time before you've even built a dashboard uh, when you just want to have uh, auto anomaly detections happening. Uh, so there's a number of benefits of having more AI when you're uh, doing data management. But the big thing here is for, I think, three decades, we've still had this 80-20 distribution between uh, organizations spending time on, on preparing the data so that it's in some kind of shape for you to actually analyze it. And only 20% of that value added activity of actually analyzing and taking decisions on the data. Uh, we've had that for three decades or more. I think if we have more AI and smarts in the data preparation phase, we may be able to flip that. Uh, if not completely, then at least to a 50-50 ratio. And that's gonna free up a lot of resources and it's going to address the very massive skills gap that we spoke about earlier, Neil, uh, when it comes to things like data engineers and other roles within data management. So there are multiple benefits of AI moving deeper into the data pipeline, I think. Fantastic. And I'm conscious we have focused a lot on a lot of the challenges that we're seeing out there at the moment. But to end on a more uh, hopeful note, what excites you about the future and what's your big focus this year? Yeah, I mean, I don't know where to spend my attention because there's so many exciting things happening. I mean, the whole human machine race that's going on right now, uh, I think it's the biggest evolution perhaps since the World Wide Web. All of these language models that are uh, evolving right now uh, with, with ChatGPT, perhaps the most famous one, but there are five to six even larger language models than that uh, under evolution. So what's, gonna, what's that going to do to society? Uh, both positive and but also challenges, of course, because the classic garbage in, garbage out has never become more important. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, language models basically telling you the truth, uh, the data underneath will will need to become truthful. So everything around data governance, data quality will become huge. Uh, but I also see this notion of there's been talks about data as an asset. Uh, and how that's evolving to data as a product, and increasingly perhaps uh, data as a currency, uh, when we're seeing central banks printing a lot of money, uh, you know, and uh, sort of devaluing the, the value of, of currency, what's the future currency? Uh, well, uh, maybe data will increasingly become a currency uh, that we can trade uh, as a product. So that whole area is very interesting. If I kind of zoom out even further, I love the stuff that, for example, Jeremy Rifkin has written about. And also there's a bunch of stuff on YouTube where he talks about Internet of Things, Internet of Energy and Internet of Transportation. Uh, I think all of those are kind of happening. Uh, everything around transportation with self-driving cars, uh, with energy where uh, battery technologies are evolving. And you can you can store um, you can store energy when energy is cheap, and then you you have this vehicle to load and vehicle to grid technologies that are evolving, where you can put that energy back onto the grid. So we're definitely de decentralizing the whole energy sector as well, and then everything with uh, kind of connected networks and and Internet of Things and Starlink, with everything being connected, is also super excited. So this kind of how how all of those huge trends are shifting society is is very exciting to me. Uh, and on a personal level, speaking about internet of of uh, transportation, I'm I'm picking up my first EV. So in the very near future, in in a few hours, actually, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, it will be a new experience for me. Wow, sounds like we need to get you back on the podcast later in the year, find out more about that experience and your takeaways from that. But obviously, data analytics can be a dry subject. So I'm going to have a little bit of fun with you now and ask you to leave something for everyone listening. And that is, 
Is there a book that has inspired you or a song that helps you get your head in the zone or, or just something you like and uh, that uh, you, you'd like to listen to and we can add to our Spotify playlist? All I'm going to ask is what are you going to leave us with and why? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, there's both technology books. I, I, I'm an avid listener. You know, I try to take walks every day and listen to audio books. And one that absolutely blew me away, and I apologize, it hasn't got anything to do with technology, <laughs> is uh, this book called Stoner by John Williams. And it has nothing to do with stoners. Uh, so I apologize <laughs> for the title. It's just the name of the person in the book. It's a very simple book about a man's uh, upbringing and life and, and a career in academia and falling in love, but it's so beautifully written. That honestly, it's I I don't think anyone's going to regret it if you're listening to that book or reading that book. It's a fantastic experience. Uh, and on the song side, I'm kind of into a band right now called War on Drugs. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, they have a bunch of cool songs. Uh, I think it's 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 a little bit of um, you know kind of Bob Dylan, a little bit of 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 John Mellencamp and 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 Don Henley. Uh, a particular song that I like is "I Don't Live Here Anymore," uh, yes. which is very, oh, you seem to you seem to concur. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely brilliant band, and what a great track as well. And uh, you mentioned the Don Henley reference; it's got a real cool '80s vibe about it. That track, hasn't it? It does. And in a parallel life, I would be that guy sitting on like beaten up trains in America, traveling the world with a guitar. So maybe it's a parallel fantasy why I like that band so much. But they're they're really good. Yeah, you and me both. Man, we'll take that that journey. And uh, for anyone listening, just wanting to find out more information about Click, everything we talked about today, what's the uh, the best starting point for everything? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can reach me on, on Dan Sommer uh, on Twitter. Uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn as well. I would love to continue the conversation and connect with as many people as possible. Uh, you can also uh, find me on the Click blog, uh, where I tend to write my musings on occasion. And uh, yeah, the Trends webinar that I did a few months ago is still active on the website, and uh, it will go into much more detail about uh, everything that we spoke about today and 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 some some more stuff. So uh, I really look forward to continuing the discussion. And, and thanks, Neil, again for inviting me to to this podcast. It's a great honor. Well, a huge thank you for joining me. I've learned so much today from the impact of market consolidation, rise of synthetic data, the need for AI to move deeper into the pipeline. But all that wrapped up and finished with the war on drugs. Great track there. I'm going to go listen to that in a moment. I'm also going to add uh, the book you mentioned, Stoner, to my audio uh, audible list. And there's a great line you used right at the beginning of the podcast about Click, and you said, essentially, we are a US company with a Swedish soul. And I think that's a, a beautiful moment to end on. So just a big thank you for sharing that with me today. Thank you very much, Neil. I appreciate it. As I said at the very beginning, Dan's an incredibly cool guy. A great way with words, great taste in books, even better taste in music. I'm going to go listen to that track now. And I'd love to hear more from you. What song or book you would add to that list? This uh, podcast is not just about me and the guests. It is also about you. So let me know any books or music you'd like to recommend. And I also invite you to join me again tomorrow. I've got another great guest lined up. What a great problem to have. So many great people lining up to come on here. And it's a real honour to speak with each and every one of them. An even bigger privilege to serve each and every one of you listening all around the world. But before I get too cheesy and sentimental and then maybe a little bit teary, I'm going to say a big thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Don't be a stranger.